Hello and welcome to the Wolf's Den. I'm Dave here with Mary Ellen and today we're going to be doing the next edition of our podcast series where we're breaking down each of the chapters. So today we are going to be taking care of Danny's first ever chapter. Yes, we are. So uh, this chapter is the first one uh, where we're not in the north. The first, the prologue, uh, Bran and... Uh, Catalan one has us all, you know, in the north or beyond the wall. So this has us in Essos, in Pentos. Uh, it starts off with Danny being given a beautiful gown from Viserys, which was a gift from Illyrio, and she would be wearing that evening, as tonight would be a night where she would need to look all a princess. Yes, she's going to be meeting Khal Drogo, and I think it's very interesting to point out that right off of the bat what he describes Danny as being or shows Danny to be is a scared little girl. Yes, she's very meek. Touching the fabric frightened her. Mm -hmm. She had never worn something so soft or so smooth or I remember, don't remember the exact wording. And she pulls her hand away and she's like it frightens her. It frightened her to touch something that was that soft. So it's kind of showing Danny is not at all what she obviously grows into being. She is a terrified little girl at this point. It also speaks to, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, she touches the fabric. Uh, the cloth was so smooth that it seemed to run through her fingers like water. She could not remember ever wearing anything so soft. It frightened her. She pulled her hand away. Is it really mine? That line right there, is it really mine, speaks to the fact that her early childhood has shaped her into being somebody that doesn't really think she deserves anything nice because she hasn't ever had anything nice. And she also doesn't necessarily trust. Like, is this really mine or is this going to be mine or are we going to have to sell it? Or gonna, what are we yes. going to have to do because they'd had a long-standing track record of having things and then losing them. Exactly. So. So it's that early upbringing and the life that she had growing up uh, that you're kind of seeing right there. She's uncomfortable with gifts and yes. especially from Illyrio because we get information on how they had been staying with this guy Illyrio who we don't know who he is yet for about a half a year and how he had been quite generous to them you know giving them rooms at the at his estate and you know feeding them um at least clothing them maybe not in the in garb such as the gown that she's about to wear tonight but basically being as kind to them as anyone that she could remember, and she questions why he's being like, so what generous. what are his motives? What does he want from us? What and, does he want from me? And Viserys is an idiot. He's like, he knows I won't forget my friends when I come <laughs> into my crown. And That's Danny exactly. <laughs> is kind of revealed in this part also to be the smarter of the two. We don't know how smart she is yet, but we know that she's the smarter of the two. Absolutely. Because she's thinking, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. This guy doesn't seem to be the type of guy that just gives gifts. I but even though she's smarter than him and kind of knows she's smarter than him, we get information about the dynamic between her and Viserys because while he's going on and on and she's kind of questioning what, his, what he's saying in her mind, she is not confident enough to question him out loud to him because she doesn't want to wake his dragon so yes. we know that he's done things to her in the past that has made her very frightened of his reaction at times yeah i mean she thinks that he'll lash her. out at her hurt her physically emotionally we've seen him do both over Absolutely. the course of the story so kind of paints the vivid picture right off the bat that he is abusive towards his sister yes and around him she particularly feels like, she can't really speak her mind. It's, and definitely not question him. So, so, that, so we get that information, which is important information, because Danny's overcoming of Viserys is an important theme throughout book one. Yes, and where she outgrows Viserys, kind of. Yes. And then the next thing that happens, I believe, is she walks over to the window and she looks wistfully out at mm -hmm. the children playing... And I think this is somewhat foreshadowing of something that we've talked about in our previous Danny um, 
podcast, what Danny truly longs for is, is a simple life. She wished that she could be like those other kids. No past, no future, yep. none of that stuff, that she could just kind of live her life and be happy like those kids are that are out in the streets playing. And she kind she, of envies the simplicity of their lives. Absolutely. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, she. I think that it's that. And I think that she envies them not because that they're... Um, it's a simple life, which she definitely does uh, desire. But it's also that she wishes to be free. In simplicity, there's a freedom that comes with it. There's not this weight of the world of, okay, you were born into this lineage, so you are expected to do X, Y, Z. Sort of in the simple life of the small folk or whatever, there's a freedom there where you can just simply live. And Danny longs for that kind of freedom. She's happiest, as you'll see later as her story progresses, she's happiest when thinking about being free or the notion of freedom to her. Just being on the open water, being with Dro Drogon, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, that, that's right there from the beginning. George consistently has her sort of longing for that. Exactly. And then they kind of go into a little exposition about how her family once ruled the Seven Kingdoms, which we haven't really learned much about the Mad King or any of that stuff yet, so we don't really know much about that, but we know from this chapter that she is of the family that used to rule before Robert. We recently learned in the last chapter that Robert's the king. These, these are the people that he overthrew. That's where you kind of figure that out. And then this is also the first time that they tell us about Rhaegar, who died, quote, for the woman he loved, which is definitely it's not a, the story that everyone else in the realm seems to be. That's a very version. nice, simplified version of that tale. And it's one of those things where um, George masterfully gives you uh, your first information being something kind of romantic and sweet and you're like oh I'm interested to learn more about him and you know first impressions matter and last and I think that's him um, starting to weave his Rhaegar web deception uh, because when you hear that you're like oh you think of Romeo and Juliet, or, you know, all these kind of... Some lo tragic love stories. These all, yes, these all-consuming love stories that have been romanticized in, in literature stories. And literature and history all over the world. I also think, I want to cycle back just for a second, because when, when she was talking about Westeros, she brings up the fact that it, like she doesn't know anything about it. Viserys calls it our land, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. But then she doesn't remember it at all. Which kind of ties into the th another theme that we talked about with Danny, is this sense of a lack of home. She doesn't know home. No. She's never had a home. Viserys considers King's Landing and the Red Keep and Dragonstone home. She's never known home. She's never known anything stable. Exactly. She's never had anything um, to provide her with security with the exception of the time when they stayed at the house with the red door. With Will and Derry. But that is something that would definitely shape a person, shape a character, that lack of uh, a stable base, um, lifeguards, if you will, a common thing that you like to say when, when you're watching something, you'll say they lacked a lifeguard. She did literally did. Viserys in ways tried, but he failed. A, he was a shitty lifeguard. Um, because he also became his resentment for their situation, created a circumstances where the lifeguard she needed needed to the lifeguard she had was someone that she also needed a lifeguard to protect her from. Yes, and he also lacked means to provide her with the things that, like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of human needs, the base before you can even get to the other like more abstract ones are just like shelter, food, stability, like all of that. So you can't progress in all kinds of other ways until those basic needs are met. And neither one of their basic needs were met. And so you can kind of see it in both of their 
personalities as they progress and it progresses through both of them in different ways absolutely um then we kind of move forward to danny's birth Mm -hmm. following when they fled king's landing when viserys was eight born in (laughs) 276, 276 plus 8 is what? 284. Every time. Every time, no matter how many times you work it out, that's what the answer is. And we learned that she was born during this epic storm that actually broke pieces of the Valyrian Citadel off. Now, we don't know how significant that is when she tells us that. We don't know anything about Valyrian construction. We don't know that it was basically indestructible and that the Valyrian roads still look exactly the same today as they did the day they built them thousands of years ago. Like, none of that. We're not privy to any of that information yet, which is a way that I think George really cleverly put that in there. Like, this was a storm unlike anything the world basically had ever seen before because it actually damaged Valyrian construction. Right. So it's like the Something gods special. were like, hell no, we cannot allow this girl to be born. Somebody was trying to stop her. Or at least force, and, it, and it's interesting because this being a song of ice and fire and the battle of yin and yang and the opposites and everywhere opposites, everywhere the war, it was a, a, a wind and water storm. Trying to stop fire from being born. Yes. Which is, George is a genius. Exactly. And then we also learned that the mother died giving birth to her and Viserys probably a lot of his resentment and anger towards her is as a result of that because she thinks that he has never forgiven her for killing their mother which is like Cersei I find Viserys to be not only cruel in ways and vicious but low IQ oh Viserys is definitely dumb uh like where somebody who had more abstract reasoning and ability to understand things might have a tiny bit in their heart of resentment towards somebody like that. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be this overriding thing that, that plagues the relationship between the two of them. A smart character would be like, it's not this girl's fault. She didn't really do anything. She was just born. It's kind of like how you can see that Jamie is clearly the smarter of the two siblings because Jamie understands that obviously Tyrion wasn't trying to kill their mother when he was born. He was just born. Being born. You don't have any intentions when you're being born. So Viserys suffers not only from just viciousness and and some like sociopathic tendencies, but he's also a low IQ. He's also dumb. Yeah, he's dumb. So the combination of the two usually is not a good (laughs) it's not a recipe for anything. Vicious and stupid. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So he's vicious and stupid. Um, that's not a combination for anything good. No, you know, that's not going to end up. That doesn't tend to end well. No. <laughs> um, in modern times, you know where that guy ends up? Jail. Prison, Pri- prison actually. Prison. Let me, let guy, me crack that. That guy ends up in prison. <laughs> if you're vicious and stupid. You're probably destined for jail or prison. Uh, jail or would death. be a best case scenario. Death, another one. You're not going to live very long and you're definitely, almost certainly, we'll take definitely out of the equation, you're not going to live a good life. No, um, and, uh, and well, so we see. But uh, yeah, so he has a resentment towards her, as you just said, and we learn about that. So again, we're getting information here to indicate he's definitely not that smart. No, he's stupid. Uh, we get some more information about, uh, this is where Danny tells you about this house with the red door, with the lemon tree outside the window, and how she longs for that place again. Exactly, and you also find out that they escaped from Dragonstone right before Stannis got there. She doesn't tell us it's Stannis. She just says the usurper's brother, but it's Stannis. And uh, they escaped from there with Willem Derry and four loyal men came in, broke into the nursery, took the two of them, and got out of there in the middle of the night before Stannis could arrive. And they took refuge on the Bravosian coast. Correct. Coast. Yes. <laughs> Now, the house with the red door, I would like to talk about this one more time. Sure. The house with the red door could easily have had a lemon tree if they were far enough down on the Bravosian coast. Or it could have just been a slight oversight because George originally had this house in Tyrosh, where lemons could easily grow. There's an annotation that says, actually, on 
this statement about the house with the red door and the lemon tree. In this paragraph, it says, in, the, in an early draft of the novel, Daenerys's house with the red door was located in Tyrosh, a much more southerly free city. So either way, it wasn't which Dorne. Um, which, <laughs> which, which, just... which ultimately is telling us that George had an oh shit moment when he read that and realized that there shouldn't be a lemon tree in Bravos, maybe. But there could maybe, be, unless there could it was be on the Bravosian coast. On the Bravosian coastline that does go very far south. I think it could. So there could have been one on the Bravosian coastline, but I think he was trying to tell people, you know, it... I put that there when they were in Tyrosh, which is way, way south, where lemons could very easily grow, and it's still possible as long as you're on the Bavosian coastline. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to bring that up one more time, even though we've brought it up like a thousand times. Mm-hmm. All right. Then after Willem Derry, their protector, died, their servants stole everything from them. Yes. And they were expelled from the house basically penniless. Yes. They started traveling to Mir and Volantis and all over the, from free city to free city. And at first, they were welcomed because they were like, oh, these are the last Targaryens, which is interesting because it seems like all those free cities hated Valyrians, but not necessarily hated Targaryens, which is in mm. a weird distinction between the two. Also, with regard to seeking refuge in within the lands of Bravos, who at least claim that they hated Valyrians. Yet, they hid the Targaryen kings, or the heir, the only surviving heirs to the house Targaryen. That's why I don't think it was in Bravos. And also, I've thought about this several times. Over hundreds of years of Targaryen rule, the Iron Bank of Bravos was doing an incredible amount of business with house Targaryen. Loans and just business as a whole with Westeros, who were ruled by the Targaryens. And after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, animosity towards a civilization that no longer exists, who these are the only surviving people from it, but they never did anything to you, that could kind of dwindle and disappear a little yeah. bit. Um, it, it's not like a fresh wound. That's from like a thousand years ago, and these people had nothing to do with it, and now they're a good business partner. And I've said this a bunch of times, peace is most readily achieved by doing business with one another. <clears throat> it could make sense if you're thinking about this from a logistical standpoint. If you're trying to hide these two people, and yes, by this point, Bravos didn't really have a problem with Targaryens necessarily or whatever. Or Valyrians. Or Valyrians. Going in a place that's sort of no man's land, the Bravosian coast, I'm sure there's stuff there. Okay, but it's not like Bravos, which is a huge port city in this world, where there's tons of people coming in and out from everywhere all around it the world. It would not be an ideal location, even if you're going to keep them in a, a, an estate or something, sort of like Pentos. You might want to go somewhere more down the coast that's less uh, frequently trafficked. Yeah, and also, especially since you have two. Silver hair, purple eyes. This is what I'm saying. Kids. They stand out, period. They're going to stand out in the crowd. Yeah. They don't look like anybody else. I would want to be more in a, 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 a no man's land that. part of town. Yeah. Not in the heart of, of the busiest port city on the planet. Yeah. Uh, so it would make sense that you would maybe be in quote unquote Bravos, yeah. but in a less populated area. We'll say like a, a villa in in the countryside. Yeah. That's That's what I always pictured. Now, I could be wrong, but that's where I picture them being. Um, and maybe that's why he changed it from Tyrosh. Because Tyrosh why... is just that island city. Exactly. And it's, again, heavily, you know, heavily trafficked, heavily populated. That they are... would seek refuge in a less yes. frequented... A more conspicuous location. Exactly. As opposed to being right there. And Tyrosh would have made a lot of sense. Because there's other people that look like that. there's a lot of Valyrian-looking people down in those... Like Mir, not so much Mir, but Tyrosh and Lys has a lot have a lot of Valyrian looking. People. But in an earlier draft, it was Tyrosh. But in the final one, it became Bravosian coast, which makes me think that he made that decision to put them sort of in a less in a more obscure location. Exactly. Anyway, I don't want to beat that dead horse, but that's that's I truly believe that is exactly where they were. All right, so we get 
information about what drives Viserys, which is one thing and one thing only. This character is motivated by restoring his family's dynasty. Yes. Now, I don't blame him for that motivation. I don't think that's a, a very odd motivation for him as a character. It's just he is not capable of the execution. Of, yeah, yeah. of executing a plan to achieve his goal. Yeah, he is the the maybe the very last person that <laughs> you would want the fate of a dynasty resting on their shoulders. The only person who's worse is Joffrey. I was just going to say, who would be worse for you, Joffrey or Viserys? Uh, Joffrey was even more vicious and even yes. dumber. Yes, I would agree. So Viserys would have been a slight upgrade to Joffrey. But yes, you don't want your, your dynasty resting on either of these people's shoulders. No, you can't. Tywin looked at him, he's like, I can't build on you. Yeah. You can't be the founder of this dynasty. So Viserys' motivation as a, as a character makes a lot of sense. Uh, his, his dad was the king. His mom was the queen. Yes, he grew up as a prince with his father as the, the king anticipating that his brother would take the throne one day and he would have some sort of high position at court. He would live in King's Landing for his whole life. Yeah, they're, they're, like, so what motivates him and, and what he's after makes complete sense. Yes. The serving, so, um, you know, he departs and the servants come to help Danny bathe. The show did a decent job of showing how Danny got into a kind of very hot water <laughs> Literally. And that she really likes the heat and water that would normally burn the shit out of somebody else. Danny seems to enjoy it. Yes. Which kind of shows us, gives us a little glimpse that the fire is in her blood. Mm hmm Like, she likes the heat. Um, can I get a little glimpse of that, too, in um, the Dunk and Egg stories, where Dunk... Talked it's about like... them when they were in Dorne. <laughs> yeah. And Dunk is just dying. And then they're in like the that great hot drought after the great spring sickness. Yes. And they're in the reach. And Dunk is like dying. He like is drenched from head to toe. He feels like he's going to die. And Egg is like completely comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like 110 degrees outside and humid. And Egg is like, so what do you want to do later? And Dunk's like, I don't want to do anything. I can't move. I can't wait to jump in that stream. Oh my God, the Chucky Waters. I'm jumping into the Chucky, <laughs> Chucky waters, waters the second we get there. And Egg's like, yeah, it's totally nice outside right now. And he's like, this, it agrees with him. So in a similar way that Egg had the fire, the, the dragon blood, it's kind of showing us that Danny has a little bit of dragon blood here. And when you're first reading or watching, that's a cool scene. Because you're like, okay, so she's special. Yes. So uh, the serving girls do what serving girls do and gossip and tell Danny everything they know about Drogo and how he's super fierce and super handsome and big and huge and his servants wear gold collars and basically they do the girly thing. And His house in based off rack has doors made of solid silver because he's like so rich. Yes. <laughs> and dreamy. And Danny's like, I don't give a shit about any of this. What the hell, Ed? I don't want this. And they put a golden collar on her and she's like, oh shit. What does this mean? I'm his slave now? What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so despite the fact that these girls really pumped him up, Danny's still not, like, really excited about this prospect. In fact, she's perplexed by it because she had always thought she would marry her brother as, you know, Targaryens uh, wed each other to keep the bloodline pure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now... It seems that he's going to marry her. And he, and he actually told her, let me back up, that the blood of the dragon does not mate with common men. But now she's confused because he's... She's confused because now you're going to marry me to some... Barbarian, which is kind of interesting, though, that he says that we don't do that. And then later... I'm skipping ahead in the chapter, but we'll circle back to it again. When... They first see Khal Drogo. He tells her that he is Aegon the Dragon come again. Yes. So it's like, in his mind, he's justifying it in that, like, this guy is, is special. Is as powerful and as fierce as... Is as special as Aegon, the founder of our dynasty. He's that guy come again, or something. Maybe. And you will be his queen. But yeah, no, and he doesn't, but again, like, he doesn't explain himself well. So it's, in Danny's mind, she's very confused. So she's struggling with this and she's feeling really anxious this is like a very she literally just would be happy or just wants to stay at Illyrio's 
but she's being pushed to do this thing. So they dress her up in the beautiful raiment. And Viserys comes to inspect her when she's all done. And of course, he's a dick. And Illyrio comes in. He, before he could even be too much of a dick, he goes, you look. And Illyrio comes in. He goes, regal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> regal. Look yeah. at her. She is the blood of old Valyria. And no, no one doubt, can doubt it. No doubt. That silver hair, the violet eyes, blah, 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 blah. She will whatever, entrance our Drogo, or whatever the heck he says. And in spite of that, Viserys' response is still a dickhead response, because he goes, she's too skinny. But whatever. Um, and, and you know what? This Danny not having confidence makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because her brother just puts her down every ten seconds. Yeah, he's really, really mean to her. Yeah. Um, just for no reason. She's not doing anything. Well, I think we find out later from Tyrion's chapter that Viserys was really upset. Because he always thought he was going to marry Danny, and now he's forced to do something else. Yes, but and still, this no, blah 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 no, blah. No. There's no excuse for Viserys' behavior. No, I'm just saying. Maybe I was just trying to add a little like psychological. Yeah, yeah, to like what yeah, might like have been layer going it on in his head. Layer there. it. Yes, people aren't like simply motivated. No. No, I mean he's also an idiot. We've he's talked and about he's this. mean. Yes. yes. All right. So this Illyrio blesses her in the name of the Lord of Light, and that was something. Did you want to mention that? I thought it was interesting. Because, like we did in our Catalan podcast um, that you guys just got a little bit ago, um, George seems to have gone out of his way in these last two chapters, Catalan's first chapter and Danny's first chapter, to kind of give us, at the very least, a rudimentary introduction to the three main religions that are going to play a central role in the story. You get the seven and the old gods in Catelyn's chapter, and she kind of explains a little bit of the difference between the two, even though she's an idiot and doesn't get it. <laughs> and then we get our first introduction to the Lord of Light, R'hllor, in this chapter, and, and Illyrio brings it up twice. He blesses her in the name of the Lord of the Light, and then explains to her that the Dothraki are bought off cheaply with palaces and blah, 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 and it's better than fighting them but we don't actually fear them. The Lord of Light says, or the Red Priests tell us, that a million Dothraki couldn't... That the Lord of Light would protect them from a million Dothraki, or whatever. He doesn't really believe it, though, not... He goes, or so they say. I, at first I was thinking that. But if you take note of what Illyrio's wearing, Illyrio is almost dressed as a Red Priest. No, he is. He's wearing flame-colored... Like multicolored, flame colored robes. He's wearing like red orange and what it look, almost looks like flames. I don't know if I'd say he would be a devout follower of Relore. I think Illyrio believes in Illyrio. True. Him, himself to make his fate and his destiny, which is not a, a bad thing. It, but yes, in any event, if he believes in anything, it would be I also, the Lord of Light. But I think he also knows, yeah, if we don't do anything. These guys could. Yeah, they'll take the city. Yeah, like they'll sack this. There city. will not be a divine intervention. <laughs> we have to be a an act, play an active role here. We can't just be totally passive. Yeah, the gods aren't just going to save. The walls us will we help. Don't. Yes. The, the the red priests say the walls will defend. Yes, and they certainly will help. And I also think it's kind of interesting that we learn about the fire god. In the fire girls' first chapter. Absolutely. Yes. So that's the, purposeful. The, that's got to be purposeful purposefully done yeah um then they get in the palanquin palanquin Pal palanquin well if you listen to roy detrice he calls it a palanquin which no he is calls why it a palanquin no he doesn't because i listened to it all right we'll have to debate right this after right before we'll let you guys we know when we get I, I just listened to it he called it a palanquin we're doing a five dollar bet all right done you're palanquin gonna, you're gonna owe me five bucks palanquin can't wait to get my five bucks no. Not going to happen, because I'm going to win that, because All right, I let's... just listened to it, and he called it that. That's what. That's why, remember you were making fun of me when we had our fir first video where I had to say it, and I was saying it like that? I was saying it the way Roy Detrice says it. And All right, well, apparently... whatever. I think correctly it's Palanquin. Whatever. You All guys right. let us know. Leave a comment. I yeah. don't care. <laughs> um, all right, Illyrio. So they're in the Palanquin, Palanquin, and they're going to Drogo's match. It's really dark. You know, they're, they've are they got the servants carrying them. It's the three, it's the three characters we've met. In this confined space, yes. 
it's Illyrio, Danny, Viserys, and or again, it's the only characters that have names. We have yeah, the yeah, serving we, girls right. or whatever, but they don't, they don't give them names. Yeah, I'm, exactly. Don't be so literal. <laughs> Can't but, help it. All right, I know, I know. Yes, technically there were other people there, and but basically it's just more of the same. Viserys acting like a, a weirdo who and doesn't understand life, and Illyrio Danny and placating Illy- him, yeah. or humoring him. Yes, and Danny thinking to herself, "Wow, Viserys is kind of dumb." B, I don't trust Illyrio. And he's sitting there <laughs> holding his borrowed sword, yeah, and touching his borrowed <laughs> sword. Danny calls it his borrowed sword. Over and over and over and over again in this chapter. Like, he's never swung a sword at anybody. Like, she's looking at her brother and thinking... I mean, she doesn't outwardly say it, but the way that she's thinking about him tells us that she thinks her brother's pathetic. Yes. Ooh, sorry. Even though she's scared of him because um, he could hurt her. Yes. Uh, it, it she's doesn't... scared of him, but she thinks he's pathetic. But that shows you that Danny still has some strength inside her. Yes. Because she, and some intelligence, because even though he's tried, not maybe intentionally, but he has done some things to kind of break her spirit and whatnot. In her inside, she's like, you are so pathetic. So there's more of that going on in the palanquin, keen scene, <laughs> whatever. Palanquin. Yeah, that. And uh, they... It's like, Viserys is like, the small folk are waiting the arrival of their king and... Aren't they? Aren't they? And, and Looking for validation. Like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That's what my sources tell me. And Danny's like, I don't have sources, but I, so I have no way of knowing, but I have a hard time believing that's true. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's, what, that's what, and she sees like a slight for like a second, like Illyrio like smirked. Like he was thinking, oh my God, this kid is so dumb. Yes. <laughs> and Viserys didn't catch it, but Danny caught it. And he doesn't catch it. Because he's a self-absorbed and vicious and b stupid. There stupid people don't sword. catch things. Yes. Borrowed yes. sword and she's like, once again, he's fighting the battle of the trident. And you're like, he never fought the battle of the trident. Is that what he like thinks he's doing when he's like daydreaming? Gosh. And he's, like, he's there and he's like, I'm gonna kill the usurper myself as well as the Kingslayer and the Lannisters and and Illyrio's like. That would be fitting. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, yeah, like, it's like patting somebody on the head. He's like, you are a special little boy. Yes, sure. It's my grandpa used to say, humoring the patient. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. So, uh, all right, so they get to the nine-towered manse of Khal Drogo, and, which we find no was given to him by the magisters of Pentos. It is opulent, well-furnished, and beautiful inside. Oh. And it's like a map. There's a little. It's not as big as uh, Illyrio's, but it's it, it is nice, and he has like unsullied guards. Right. He ha- which is also extremely undone. A little scribe to announce their coming, and it's a guest list that is outrageous. And as we said in our call, Drogo, Aegon the Dragon Lord, come again, and and in Danny videos, this is not an ordinary call. He does not. Look Danny doesn't things. know that yet. No. Because she doesn't know Dothraki yet. No. But. So she's still just very frightened and surveying the room, and she observes men of all different shapes and sizes, but they're all very important. And then she realizes, to her dismay, that she is literally the only woman in this place. Yep. There's one. It's 100% men, and then her. That's... Which is another reason why we think, and there's all these really important men from every corner of the planet. They have... Princes from the Summer Isles. They have the Archon of Tyrosh's brother. They have men from Ib. They have literally diplomats and important people from every corner of the world, as well as one Westerosi knight. Yeah. So literally, this is nothing. This is not normal for a call to have friends like this. He's hosting a huge party at his place. And he has friends from every corner of the planet, including places that you can't go to on a horse. Uh huh. Right. That's a great point. And he he has all of these really important friends from all over the world at his house, which almost makes me think this is. And there's no women there. None of them brought dates. Yeah, this is a very important. This is a meeting. Yeah, almost. it like, has to be. It's like, yeah, they're taking care of introducing him to Danny at this important meeting at his house. 
Yes. Or something. I, that's, I still think that. And I think that they must have known something about really what the true, what Drogo's true intentions were. Because merchants and tradesmen and whatnot, if he was like, listen, we as a Dothraki are so powerful that we possess control over this massive land, piece of land in Essos. If I could get even some changes within my people, do you know how much money we could make? Yes. And this, if he's got the dragon eggs, now he has the dragon. control the most valuable land in the entire world, world with the exception of maybe the Reach. Yeah, and it's just sitting there. Accomplishing so nothing. So if Drogo said to these guys, if I can even make, like, some changes, do you know how much money we could make? Like, I'm going to need dragons to make this happen. Absolutely, because these guys, because the Dothraki are... I need to bend the Dothraki to my will, where they fear me on such a level... By force. ...that I can... Like kind of like what Egg was thinking. He's Absolutely. Like, I can't do that. I don't have enough power. But if I had dragons, I could make these. Which is why I really changes. believe he had the eggs. Illyrio pl- provided the girl that could probably hatch them. That could hatch them. And then they could make the plan come to fruition. And I think maybe some of these men were, at least some going of them, going to be benefactors of this of this new arrangement where they were like, we are going to become the richest people that have ever lived. Let's do this. Yes. Uh, because George doesn't have. Um, there be this massive land, this massive piece of land that's just uninhabited and not account for what that would mean. To what an the, economy on that entire continent. Yes, there's no way that's an oversight. That was intentionally done from the beginning. I figured out how big it is. It's bigger than the entirety of Westeros. Yeah, no, there's an annotation that says it is. The Dothraki Sea, like I, I looked at the maps and I like gauged it with a scale and I was like, that's bigger than the entirety of Westeros. Completely unused. And it's like, that would be like the United States not using the Any Great natural Plains. resource, yeah. Like, the Great Plains is in the United States produces like an astronomical percentage of the entire world's food comes from right there. This is what I'm saying. So this is a problem, and that's not an oversight, and that's the way George had it written from the beginning. So that's why I think these important men are here who are looking at this and are like, well, how do we get rid of Dothraki? How does this change here? And then they met a guy like a, like a Ragnar yeah, who had a vision of something else. And, he, and they kind of are showing us in this first scene when we wouldn't even recognize it. No, like, you Khal wouldn't. Drogo's not normal for a Dothraki. He has this palace. He likes, then we later find out he likes fine wines. And he, he likes, likes to hang out likes there. He likes to hang out there. He likes... And all of these guys are his friends. That's why they're at his house. Yes. Like, this is not normal. The Dothraki don't even have huts. They're nomads. Yeah, they, like, sleep in tents that That they bring with them. them, yes. But, like, no structures, no, like, you know, nice furnishings on the inside. This guy has, like, um, oil sconces, uh, like, incense stuff. Like, you know, it's very, it's very well kept. He has, like, an opulent palace. Yeah, Exactly. It's not it's not exactly a Versailles, but man, this no, place is nice. It's very nice. And uh, it's well kept. Yes. Perfectly maintained and manicured. So, um this is where we we see Jorah Mormont, the young bear. <laughs> and he's just there, so that's just a quick little thing. We're like, Oh, there's a knight from the Seven Kingdoms there, and we find out why he's there. And then we Illyrio. A man should, should be, be able, able to, to do sell his what own, he wants well, with his, his own chattel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, all right, dude. All right, dude, relax. So, yep, that speaks... Okay, so there's a big cultural divide that exists. Essos is still heavily trade, uh, slave trade and sl- uses slaves. Westeros seems to be a slave-free. Yes, there are servants, but they're paid, and there's tradesmen that get paid, and you're not just owned. Yes, well, so, regardless of what people have tried to tell us about feudalism and the people being essentially slaves, like that's not the same thing. I was like, being a servant to somebody and being owned by somebody are way different. No, like, either like, do would I like to do either? No, no, I would not. I, I, like, I, I one is an enormous step above the other, even though it's still not good. I was like, that they're not even in the same category. And of, really, of even today, you're not. We're not servants, but y- you go to work. For forty yeah. hours or fifty hours, you have a or, boss that can tell you what to do, is and your your um, life is maintained by this money that you need. So it's not like there's a big difference between being owned and, and working for someone for some compensation. Yeah, 
Yeah. Be it, uh, be it, they give you a house to live in, whatever it is. Yeah, whatever it was different you're being then. Compensated, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I wouldn't prefer either, but you know, that's me. All right, so we we meet. Well, we don't really meet Jorah. No, we don't. We, meet we just Jorah see here. him. We just see him. Yes, he intrigues Danny that there's a Westerosi night there. Absolutely. And Viserys is like, I want to speak to him tonight. Yeah, yeah. You will bring him to me, but he's an idiot. All right. But that makes sense because say you're very far away from home and somebody's like, look, that person's from your town or your your state even or whatever. Yes. You'd be like, oh my gosh, I want to talk to them. That's the I've first never... Westerosi person that Besides she's ever seen. Besides my brother. Yeah. But, and the, Willem Derry. And Willem Derry, but she's not familiar with Westerosi people. She's like, oh my God, there's a real live Westerosi person right so there. So that was a good little thing that George added. So she, they point out Drogo to her and she realizes that the slave girl wasn't really wrong. He's a full head taller than every than the tallest other person in the room. Yep. Which means there was other big people in the room, and he was a full head taller than they were. How tall you have him pegged? I have him at like six eight, six nine, six ten. Okay. Like he's a big. Wow. Man. Like he is a monster of a man. Because let's just say the other tallest guy in the room was six two or three. Bottom of your head to the top of your head's what eight nine inches. Ten inches? I don't know. Um, <laughs> your units of measurement and you are not friends. I was like, so let's just say that, let's, we'll just say your head's eight inches tall, just to make it simple. Okay, yeah. If he's a full head taller than the next tallest guy, the next tallest guy's 6'2", six 6'3", he's got to be close to seven feet tall. Yeah, so, okay, like, so he's massive. Like, he is a huge man. To um, her delight, he was younger than she imagined. Yes. I would, I mean, being a 14 year old girl, I would be delighted by that. I think she's 13. 13. She is delighted by that. Uh, he's about no more than 30. She hasn't pegged at. He's got the copper skin, thick mustachios, the long braid, blah. He's good looking. Yeah. Yep. She's like, okay, this could be worse. Um, Illyrio went over to speak to him, and Viserys stays back and tells her the whole story about his braid, Look which is a really cool when you read this for the first time. Thank you. Dothraki have to cut their braids off in shame if they're defeated. Call Drogo's braid. He's seven feet tall, and his braid goes down to, like, almost his knees. His braid goes well past his buttocks and down to, like, the middle of his thighs, which means his braid is almost as tall as Danny. So yes, he has probably never as tall as me. been defeated. <laughs> And, um, uh, so that's a cool little thing when I watched the show and read the books the first time. I like that little uh, fact that he put into the cultural aspects of Dothraki. And at this point, although he's not as scary as she thought, and even maybe better looking and younger and everything like that. She does like say that. that Viserys is mean, but this guy scares her more than Viserys because of like the ferocity that she sees in him. Yes. Like, and she, this is a dangerous And she man. has a raw reaction. Yes. After really looking at him. She's like a little delighted at first, but then she looks at his eyes and his face and she becomes scared. And then she has a raw reaction, which Viserys observes. And she actually says, I don't want to be his queen. I just want to go home. And he says, well, how are we supposed to go home without an army? And she just meant, I just meant to Illyrio's. She which was Which is also the sense of, that I was talking about earlier, where it kind of brings that Danny is a woman without a home. Or a girl without a home. Absolutely. Uh, it, he brings that in. Danny's in search of home throughout her entire story, and it begins right in her very first chapter. Because she's never had it. She's never had a home. She is a girl in search of a home from the very beginning. Absolutely. And I think we talked about that quite a bit in our Danny series as well. Oh, yeah. Yes. This doesn't please Viserys. He's a dick. Um, he tells her that basically he would let Khal Drogo and all 40,000 of his men and horses to fuck her if that was what was required. To get his army. <laughs> so and Drogo starts walking over and Viserys goes, dry your eyes and smile and stand up straight. And Danny dries her eyes, smiles, and stands up straight. Yeah. That's how the chapter ends. So um, I always really enjoy Danny's chapters. Uh, this is a good introduction chapter when you're first reading this. This would be really interesting to me. I'm trying to remember how I felt when I first read it, and I think I really liked it. Uh, it this I'm this isn't about comparing it to the show, but the show did an okay job of showing this chapter. Yes. 
it kind they of didn't, they got rid of the the party at Call Drogo's place, and they just and had, had it, and they kind of fast forwarded through the whole thing, and they had it at Illyrio's, right? Yeah, yeah. Which Call okay. Drogo showed up at Illyrio's, took one look at her, and rode away without saying. That's right. Anything. That's right. Like, so there were Trust some me, changes. If he didn't like her, we would know. Or but whatever the dynamic like between the people was a good. Did a, they did a good job visually with that? Like the dynamic between Viserys and Danny, Illyrio's role, that whole thing. Uh, Drogo's ferocity, Drogo's role. That was all pretty clear in the show. And um, I mean, when Drogo shows up in the show, you're like, who is this ferocious man? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Like, I would not want to fight that guy. That guy is like, his, th- that guy's feet are almost touching the ground, even though he's on a horse. I mean, look right. at that freaking man. <laughs> like, like, that guy is huge. Don't fight him. But I do think that this chapter really sets the stage from a plot standpoint the thematic standpoint, the symbolic standpoint. You learn about fire gods in the in the fire girls chapter. You learn Danny's a girl in search of a home. You find out that, that she's intelligent, but at this point still very timid and a frightened little girl. And we're, we're going to get to see her grow out of that into a powerhouse. Yeah, she has an arc. Yes, she has a very distinct Some arc. Some people don't have arcs. That's what some people don't, I think, realize about... Like Christopher um, Moltisanti. Where's my arc? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's what made me think of this. Because in being somebody who studies stories and wants to write one of my own someday, there are some people, actually, that I've known in my life that don't have arcs. Uh, everyone wants to think you'll no, have an arc. Nor are some people even interested in it. No, exactly. Like when I grew was growing up and I worked the summer jobs on masonry sites and stuff like that, those guys didn't care about an arc. Those guys were simple. Like, they were happy with what they the, what they were doing. They go to work. They work hard. They get paid. They provide for themselves and their family. They go home. Like, Polly says to, to Christopher in The Sopranos, not that we're here to talk about that. He goes, I don't have an arc. Uh, what do you mean? I was in the army. I do this. I take care of my ma. That's it. I'm half a wise guy. <laughs> yeah, it's I it. I take care of my ma. But Danny definitely has an arc. She's special. A huge arc. A distinct arc. And um, not just because she's the mother of dragons, she has arcs in other ways too, which we'll talk about in future podcasts. So we hope that you... Enjoyed this one. And uh... if you have any ideas or comments or whatever, you want to find out who won the bet, go on ahead over and listen to... Uh... Roy Detrice <laughs> in the first chapter, he calls it a palanquin. Or palanquin, or whatever. palanquin. All right. A well, palanquin, that's what he calls it. All right, well, we'll continue fighting about that off <laughs> offline. And, um, <laughs> and uh, enjoy this, and uh, we'll see you next time.